It was previously mentioned uh, by Emma that anatomical deficits in the upper airway are likely to be involved in the pathogenesis of OSA. So the Malapati class was developed to assess intubation risk, actually, based on the morphology of the oral pharyngeal structures. But it's also been commonly employed as a simple assessment tool for OSA. So you can see as you move between the classes, the less oral pharyngeal structures that are actually observed during direct visualization, just by the time you get to class four, only the hard palate can be visualized, the more at risk the patient is for having OSA. Another assessment tool is a Friedman tongue position technique. Again, higher numbers indicating less visualization of those oral pharyngeal structures, and again, the greater the risk. A meta-analysis in 2013 actually compared both of these uh, assessment tools, and they found that both were significantly correlated with predicting OSA severity. Now, the diagnostic accuracy for determining the presence and severity of OSA does continue to be debated, such that other risk factors should also be considered, such as body mass index, the age of the patient, when you're thinking about whether that individual has risk for OSA. So we know that OSA and neurogenic disorders commonly co-occur. Co OSA is really common in stroke, Parkinson's disease, spinal cord injury, and multiple sclerosis, and many other disorders in which dysphagia also co-occurs. So we have this complex relationship with neurogenic populations between OSA and dysphagia co-occurring. We know that OSA is a major risk factor for cardiovascular disease. And one study in a stroke population found that dysphagia was associated with increased OSA severity in individuals following stroke. Now, dysphagia in the study was assessed using screening tools. Um, so the pathophysiology of dysphagia what isn't extremely clear from the study's findings. However, they perceived that this underlying mechanism or underlying relationship between dysphagia and increased OSA severity may be due to pharyngeal muscle dysfunction, which is related to both disorders. But again, they didn't conduct instrumental assessment, so the pathophysiology of dysphagia in, in, in these individuals wasn't clear. And there is overall limited research on the nature and consequences of OSA and dysphagia in these neurogenic populations. So my real take home message here is that it's really important to consider that OSA and dysphagia are really likely to co-occur in individuals with cardiovascular disease, such as a stroke population that we commonly manage as speech language pathologists. So in relation to these um, other, other disorders or neurogenic disorders, it's important to um, consider these two questions. So as speech language pathologists, we may wanna consider does pre-morbid OSA increase OSA severity as a result of the expected sensory and motor changes that arise as a result of obstructive sleep apnea? So that's our first important consideration in terms of if we have an individual presenting with OSA pre-morbidly before their stroke, how might that influence their present their severity of dysphagia when we see them with regards to these motor and sensory changes? And secondly, it may be important to consider in individuals with um, cardiovascular disease or stroke, our stroke population or progressive neurological disorders, do these individuals have undiagnosed OSA when they present in the hospital? And how this might impact on their dysphagia recovery and or prognosis. However, a key additional factor with individuals with OSA and dysphagia is to consider how does obstructive sleep apnea impact the upper airway. So I discussed earlier the sensory abnormalities that are common to this patient population, so reductions in taste, smell, mechano, chemo and thermal sensation that are likely present in individuals with OSA and also motor abnormalities or motor changes. So they may have increased strength in the upper airway in, during wakefulness but increased endurance as a result of this change from type 1 to type 2 muscle fibers in the upper airway. So it's important to consider how these additional impacts that OSA cause can impact the upper airway and as a result our management of dysphagia in this population.